Hello and welcome to the garden. So today I am starting off my tomatoes, the most important crop for us every season. And for the last two years I have grafted my own and I'm very happy with the results and okay it's a bit of a faff but it's not that hard and anybody can graft their own tomato plants. Now grafted plants from the garden center or, or mail order wherever you get them from they're pretty expensive and there's a limited range of varieties that are available. Now my preference is generally speaking for an old regional variety something a little bit unusual often and I'm just not going to find those as ready grafted plants so if I want the benefits of grafting I've got to do my own and there are really two main benefits and I've talked about these a lot in previous grafting videos so I won't go into too much detail here but you've got of course improved vigor and productivity and that's great you get potentially larger fruits more of them and yeah overall a bigger yield that's not the main motivation for me doing that I'm, I'm delighted to get a bigger yield of course but the main reason is because I'm growing um, in the old greenhouses there in soil where I've grown tomatoes for many years and the grafted plants have much higher resistance to soil-borne pests and diseases so they are healthier happier plants and because I'm planting in the beds there there's plenty of room for that vigorous rootstock to spread out and I mean the roots are, are huge and they'll go right across the the bed there and you, you simply can't give them that sort of space in a in a little pot so I, I really do like it that we're planting in the ground but because we've used that same soil year after year there can be a sort of a decline in productivity and I'm pretty sure that I've noticed that over the years and I mean we still get good 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 enough tomatoes from regular plants but the grafted ones do fantastically well so I imagine I imagine here on out I will be grafting each year. So today I'm sowing the varieties and in a few days time I will sow the root stocks. The varieties I'm just going to start off in this module tray. It's a decent size. It's th these aren't small cells. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't start the plants in here if they were going to be in here for very long. I should probably start the rootstocks in seven centimeter square pots. Um, but these are only going to be here until grafting, at which point I cut the tops off, graft them onto the rootstocks, throw the rest of them away. Now, I've gone a little bit mad because um, last, last season I tried to reduce the number of varieties I was sowing because it, it went a bit crazy. Now, I'd like 40 grafted plants, which means, unfortunately, that I have to sow quite a few. And I'll probably fill three of these trays up. Uh, what would that be? I think that would be 84. So, yeah, I, I need about twice as many to start with that than, than, I, than I want plants at the end. The usual reason for sowing a few more would be germination rate on the tomato seed. Generally speaking, tomato seed germinates pretty well. Um, I do have a couple of bags where I've saved some seed or where it's old seed, so they might not germinate quite as well. I'll probably sow several of each in each cell for the old ones. But generally speaking, you don't have to have a huge allowance of, for extra plants for tomatoes. But on top of that, I then have to allow for the fact that some of them won't be the right size for grafting. And that's always the tricky bit. And maybe after six years, 10 years, I will have mastered that. But right now it's all a little bit tricky to get the timing right. 
Um, you've got to be able to get the rootstock and the, the scion, the variety you want to graft onto it, to pretty much the same diameter somewhere up those stems. So that's the tricky bit. So it, it always happens that there'll, there'll be a few that have raced away and maybe they're, they're just too fat to graft. And there'll be a few runty specimens that, that are too skinny. So I need to make an allowance for that. And then I need to make a third allowance for failures of the graft itself. Now, the first season I did this, I had about 85% success. And I was actually pretty happy with that. I, I know that uh, it, it's possible to get that quite a bit higher and uh, that's great but if I could guarantee every time you get an 85% or above I would be quite happy but last season was fantastic uh, I think it was about 98% something mad to be quite honest I don't ever expect to get that rate again because I think that was that was pretty high and um, I'm, I'm going to allow for far more losses than that in case there's a, a problem with it. And one of the big things I think in the first year was that I got the watering slightly wrong because the, you don't want to water the rootstocks uh, too close to the grafting time because you then get this, this pressure of the, the sap and it's much better if if the day before grafting you you don't water them and that 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 sap rising can can force the graft union apart before it's got a chance to heal so it physically pushes it apart and that of course is not what we want if it's forced apart it won't heal and then the the plant fails so that was possibly the main reason for the for for quite a few of the failures in the first season and last year I was very careful to fix that so that could have been why it was pretty successful but I don't want to I don't want to rely on sort of a 98% success rate because there's every possibility that I, I never achieve that again so I need to make a, a sort of a healthy allowance and probably once I factored in those three different things the germination rate the uh the fact that some of them won't be in a fit state to graft and then losses due to the grafts not healing. I'm going to probably sow twice as many as I need. Now, so, so I need 40 plants, but I've gone completely mad here and I've got 20 different varieties, so I don't need many of each of these. And my intention after last year we've grown quite a lot of Italian varieties and I, I do love the Italian tomato varieties but I was planning to explore a little bit more of Eastern Europe and and some and some American varieties I don't have room for that because I had the opportunity to grab a big pile of Italian sorts, some of which I've grown before and I know I like, and quite a few that are new to me. Um, some of the new ones though are fairly similar to ones that I have grown before, but anyway, there's a fantastic collection once again of sort of heritage Italian tomatoes and I love that. And uh, one of the things I love about Italian varieties, because I grow quite a lot of Italian varieties, it's, it's the, the regionality of everything and that, that each little area has its own local varieties that have been nurtured for many, many years. And, and some of these tomato varieties are very old indeed. Well, as old as they can be for something that came from, from the Americas some hundreds of years ago. So obviously they're not, they're not that old relative to some of the other crops we've got in the garden, but at least some of these varieties have been hanging around for a few hundred years and that is always interesting to me um and to be honest varieties for me are are incredibly important it's one of it's one of my favorite things picking out the varieties 
to grow. So not just a, an arbitrary, an arbitrary choice, but something interesting, something old, something local. That's what I love. Um, I was also planning to grow some more yellow tomatoes, and I will be again because I'm still hunting for a really great large yellow tomato. In fact, any yellow tomato, but I think I'm more likely to find a well-flavoured sort amongst the larger tomatoes because I think in general it's the case that the larger sorts have more flavour anyway. And, and last year I found the first one that I really liked and that was ananas. And this year I will be growing another one as well. So I thought I'd run through the list. It's all a little bit boring because most of these are in little paper envelopes so I don't have any pictures to show but I've kind of sorted them out into yellows, small fruited tomatoes then, and the larger sorts. So I've got three yellowish tomatoes. One of course is the Sun Gold. It's the only hybrid, it's the only modern tomato on this list. And I grow that one mostly for my wife. She loves to pop down to the greenhouse or the polytunnel and have a little snack on a few of those sweet tomatoes. I've got to be honest, they're okay, but it's not quite my cup of tea. A lot of sweetness, not a lot of balance to the flavour for my particular taste. I'd much rather pull off a few of the little red ones, but anyway, I'll grow a couple of Sun Gold for her. I do that every year. Then I'm going to give that ananas a second try. The fruits were delicious last year, and it's a very beautiful tomato. When you cut through it, it has sort of flushes of pink or, or red inside alongside the, the sort of yellowy orange main color there. Um, productivity was poor. Um, now I'm used to growing heritage varieties where the productivity can be pretty poor, but these were grafted and still dreadfully, dreadfully poor. By, by far the least productive tomato that we had last season. Um, Nonetheless, I want to give that another shot. Now, I, I had lots of recommendations for yellow ones to try, and, and I do want to work my way through that list, but this year I'm trying the yellow brandy wine. Now, brandy wine is a great old tomato from America, and I've grown what is probably the original, the, the pink brandy wine. And that is a fantastic tomato, no doubt about it. It's a big beefsteak tomato, it's beautiful pink colour, absolutely delicious, succulent flesh, lovely, very nice tomato. Um, and I was considering growing that one again anyway, but instead I've gone for a, a yellow variant. Not tried that before, no idea what that will be like, but I look forward to giving those yellow ones a second outing this year. and. We'll see whether I'm convinced by either of those. Right, so now on to the Italian sorts. I've got 17 here. I've split them into the small and large fruited sorts. And we've got more small tomatoes than we normally grow. So I, I do like to have one or two of the smaller fruited sorts. They're useful for different purposes. Um, I'm probably going to fill the polytunnel just with small fruited ones. The canes that I grow them up there will be well suited to that. Some of the heavier fruited ones, they give the canes a bit of stress. I've got um, trellising made out of reinforcing mesh in the greenhouses, and that's much more robust, well suited to supporting the uh, bruisers that are on the large fruited list. Some of those can be incredibly heavy, over, over a kilo, some of those. So you, you don't want that hanging off of a bamboo cane. It's not going to do it any good. Um, now, I've got a couple from Campania that I've grown before, Pianolo del Vesuvio and Corberino. The Pianolo, I think, was my favourite of several small fruited Italian sorts that I grew a couple of years ago. And uh, I would probably only grow that one again, except that I've, I've got a few seeds left of Corberino. So I'm going to sow those. I'm going to save some seed, hopefully, from all of these varieties so I can keep the collection going. They're a little bit tricky to get hold of some of these. Uh, then 
from Abruzzo, I've got Borgo Celano. It's another small one, never grown that one before, so don't really know much about it. Tondo Maramano from Tuscany, which basically a round, small round one from Maremma. So we're down on the coast, pretty right down in the south of Tuscany, or maybe just the very north of Lazio there. And that's from that region. It's supposed to be very nice. Never tried it before. It will be interesting to find out. And then from Puglia, I've got two Fiaschetto. Now, that one is pretty famous, I think, um, but I haven't grown it before. In terms of size, it's very much, I think, like the Pianolo, and I'm really looking forward to giving that one a go. I've got more seed of that than the other, so I'll probably sow a few extras of that sort. And the other one is uh, from Torre Maggiore. So, again, a Puglian variety, another small, I think, roundish tomato. Haven't tried that one before. So plenty of new ones on the list to have a look at. On to the large one. So I've got a couple from Tuscany here, which I have grown before. Canestrino di Luca. Um, it's a pretty good performing tomato. I, I don't, I don't think I'd say it was the best for anything in particular. It won't be, I think, the best flavoured of those on this list. It might not be the most productive. It could be though. I mean, it's, but it, but as an all round tomato, it's a good doer. So I'm, I'm very happy to grow that one again. And actually I say I've grown the other one. I probably haven't. Pisanella, um, sorry, Pisanello. Um, I've certainly grown something very much like it. It is one of the, the ugly, slightly flattened, deeply ribbed sorts that are pretty common. And, and there's something like this from various regions. So um, maybe the most well known is, is, is that from Florence to Costelluto Fiorentina. That one is, is pretty common. Um, but this is something very similar from from Pisa and supposed to be the perfect tomato for bruschetta. So I, I look forward to that. Um, I imagine it's going to be very similar to the others. This one is said to have a very thin skin, so that might be interesting. Um, then I've got another one of a similar sort. They look very similar. Uh, this is Riccio de Parma, so from Emilia Romagna. And another one I think is from that region, though I'm not absolutely certain, Ladino di Panocchia. I, I don't know anything about that tomato. I, I need to do a bit of research on that one, but I think they're both from up in the north there. Um, and then I've got a couple from Calabria, and one of these is possibly my favorite from this list, and it's, it's Belmonte. Now, there are two tomatoes from Belmonte. There's another Costa Luto, so a, a, a ribbed tomato. It's okay, but it doesn't excite me particularly. And that's not the one I want. I've, I've grown both of these uh, Belmonte tomatoes and one of them's okay, the Costa Luto. The other one, is I think exceptional and that's the ox heart type and it's huge. The, these tomatoes are massive and they are succulent, very well flavored, beautifully balanced for, for the salad and they're pretty good in cooking too because it's quite a meaty flesh, not too seedy. It's, it's just an all round cracking tomato. And I think pretty productive, at least when they're grafted. I haven't grown this one as a, as a regular plant, I don't think. Um, I may have had some in the first season, but certainly the grafted plants are immensely productive for this Belmonte. Sometimes referred to as the giant of Belmonte, but that's, that's the one I, I really like. I'm, I'm not so bothered about the Costa Luto. It's just It's just okay there are lots of them that are of that sort so that one's not so special for me 
Um, and then I've got another giant one, Gigante della Sila. I have no idea about this one. Um, however, but it's, it's from Calabria, but it's quite similar, I think, in appearance at least, um, to one of those from Campania that I've grown before, Rosa di Sorrento. And I'm growing both of those this year, the Rosa di Sorrento. I had one seed left. Um, for last year so I, I sowed it I didn't graft it for fear of uh, killing off my only specimen but it managed to produce some fruit and I, I took actually the plant was dreadful but it was just wedged in a corner of the polytunnel but it, its only mission last year really was to produce some seed for me so I do have some seed of that and I will grow that again but both of those are really large fruited uh, one I know for sure has huge fruits, Rosa di Sorrento. It doesn't have as many as the Belmonte, I think, but so I think overall Belmonte is more productive, but Rosa di Sorrento has huge fruits and they are delicious too. But both of those are one of those pinkish colored tomatoes. Very pleasant indeed. Uh, and also then from Campania, I've got a new one for me and that's Diecidita di Napoli, <laughs> which translates as the Ten Fingers of Napoli. So this is a plum type, uh, gets its name apparently because it hangs in bunches of, that somehow resemble fingers. Looking at pictures of them, it is a chunky, somewhat rustic plum tomato. So if your actual fingers look like that, you need to see a doctor, but Anyway, that's the name of it, Ten Fingers of Napoli. Uh, I've never grown this one before, and what I have grown quite a few times is San Marzano. And of course, that's the, the famous plum tomato, great for canning, and it doesn't do great here for me, if I'm completely honest. It's always been a bit of a disappointment and it may be that, I mean, it's true when, when you're growing varieties from other parts of the world, ones that are adapted to their local environment, when you bring them here, some of them thrive. And in fact, many of the Italian varieties thrive because large parts of Italy are not baking hot. <laughs> so they, they've got quite a lot of pretty hardy varieties, varieties that will grow here quite happily. And I've grown many of them, but there's always the case that, that there are some things that when they're from their particular region are especially great. And, and it may be that the San Marzano is, is like that. It could also be that the tomato is overhyped. That's potentially also the case. I mean, they, as a canned tomato, they do carry a premium, but they are very nice. Um, I often have some cans of the San Marzano for when I'm making proper pizza. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and the flavor of those is great, but I don't know. They've never really thrived here and maybe my conditions aren't quite right here. So I, I had planned nonetheless to try them again this year. And that's because I've never tried a grafted San Marzano. So I thought I would graft them this year and, and see how they did. But then I came across this ten-fingered fella and I thought I would give that one a try. It's something maybe a little bit more interesting, a little bit less common. One day I'm sure I will try the San Marzano grafted and see if that helps with their performance here. Certainly the ungrafted plants, I haven't, I haven't done great with them. Um, what else have I got? Oh, one of my old favourites, and I haven't had seed of this one for quite some years, but I'm really looking forward to getting this one again. It's Pera d'Abruzzo. It, it's a fantastic, pretty large tomato. One of the, as the name suggests, pyroform sorts, like an upside down ox heart. Delicious, nice, succulent, fairly dense flesh. It's good for a, a sauce and it's delicious just eaten fresh. That is a wonderful tomato and it's been some years since I've been able to find 
the right seed for that. So I'm very pleased about that. And then I've got Pantano. Now this one's easy to get hold of. Seeds of Italy sell this variety. And I've got some old seed, so it's a few years old now. So I will sow that pretty thick. Um, but I, I imagine it will germinate. Tomato seed is one of the more reliable seeds for you know keeping for some years. Um, now Pantano is from Lazio. Um, it is a good all-round tomato. They're good size sort of beef steak tomatoes, somewhat flattened. Actually, this one I do have a picture of. Um, if I drag that out. There we go. A slightly flattened beef steak tomato. Now they can have a bit of green about the shoulders, as in that illustration. Um, I found that quite variable. Some of them ripen more uniformly than others. I'm never troubled about uniform ripening and on those big tomatoes, in fact, it's important to get to them before it looks completely ripe on the outside because the tomato ripens, well, from the, from the blossom end up, so that the bottom of the tomato will be the ripest, but also from the inside out. So if you, you're going to have a tomato that looks almost completely green on the outside, if you get it when there's it's just, that green is just starting to, to turn a little bit paler and you cut through, very often you'll see a pink blush in the, in the center and you'll see, you'll see pink or red around the, around the seeds. So yeah, they open from, they ripen from the inside out so that if you wait until, on a big tomato, if you wait until the outside is perfectly ripe looking and uniformly ripe, you cut into it and you find that actually, it's gone too far by four or five days on the inside. So I never mind about a little bit of that green on the shoulders. And there are quite a few where that's quite characteristic. And you, you pick them when they, they would look unripe, but actually when you get into them, they are perfect. Pantano, um, it, it's a good sized fruit. So I think generally speaking, one would think that was a, a large fruited sort. It's not large when compared to uh, the Sorrento or Belmonte tomatoes, but it, it's a good sized fruit, especially when grafted. That does make quite a difference to the fruit size on these because I have grown both of these grafted and ungrafted and the grafted ones were larger and better. It's pretty productive in either case and the fruit has good flavor, good texture, all round, it's a pretty solid tomato. Is it my favorite from this list? Probably not, but it's gonna be somewhere near the top of the list in terms of you know, a, a good doer. It is a solid tomato, so I'm very happy to grow that one again. But that's one that, if anything, the, the ease of getting the seed makes it a little bit less exciting. Um, and another one that I think is reasonably well uh, available is a is another one of the pear-shaped tomatoes from El Benga. So we're in Liguria now. So I, with these tomatoes, I got a trip round a large portion of Italy, and I really enjoy that. And yeah, I've gone mad. Seventeen Italian varieties. Um, well, that's sorry about that. That was an ever such a long introduction to the varieties, but I don't know. Maybe maybe that's not so interesting to to every gardener, but for me, I love looking at all of the varieties, and I know there are many gardeners that get get equally excited when they get their hands on the seed catalog and can figure out what they want to grow. And um, that's one of the great pleasures, I think, of the of the kitchen garden. As to sowing these, well, just really very little to film. I'm going to start them in these, as I mentioned earlier. I've got my usual sort of potting mix here, sieved compost, coir, bit of vermiculite, quite a light mix, so roots get into it easily. Um, it's quite nice to prick out from, although I'm not pricking these out. They're going to stay in here until I decapitate them when I do the grafting. But yeah, that's it for varieties. 
and apologies for that lot of waffle. I'll sew a few and then shut this down because you, you don't want to see me faffing around sewing just a few seeds of each variety. Not when I've got 80 odd to sew, so time to get on with it. Right, I faffed around for so long, the rain has arrived, so apologies if there's any noise on the uh, soundtrack there. It does make a bit of a racket on the roof here. So I'm just going to lightly fill this cell tray up to start with. As you can see, this is really light compost mix. And then I'm going to press each cell down a little bit because if I don't, they'll just slump as soon as I water it. Depends what your compost is like, but this one is pretty light. All right. I mean, if it was a fairly solid blend, you wouldn't want to do that. You don't want you don't want compact soil in there. And then a good soaking, I think. You can see it's dropped a little bit just from that. And yeah, there it goes. Oh, that's a that's about right. And then, as usual, I'll make just a little dimple in the middle. Not too deep. And I'll drop the seeds into that. Right, so first up is Pisanello. Um, let's have a look. I don't know if they're loose in these packs or... Hopefully they're in a... No, they're not. They are loose. I shall move these into little Ziploc bags, I think. I think they should keep better. Um, a huge amount of seed there. So, because I don't have much seed of these, many of these Italian varieties, I'm just going to sow one per cell. And a lot of these packs have got 10 seed in, so I'll sow half of it and, and keep the rest for next season. So, just, I'll do five cells. I want, I want to make sure I've got enough plants to to graft uh, Riccio de Palma ah this one is in a bag Even though it's sieved, there are always bits of old wood and junk in the compost, of course. I mean, mostly it doesn't matter. Right. Um, and on it goes, so... I mean, it's just nothing exciting to look at there, so I'll pop back when I'm finishing the tray off. Right, that tray is now full, and I just want to very gently top up the compost with some care. I don't want to disturb the seeds. That's not bad. So, 
that is done. Now we're going to pop that into one of the heated propagators. I'll have that set at about 21. I think the optimum germination temperature might be a little bit higher than that. But if I have them out here, as soon as the sun pops out, the temperature in the propagator can spike if I haven't ventilated it. So I like to keep at the lower end of the ideal germination temperature. And then if the temperature does pop up a little bit, it's not going to cause them any trouble. So in the propagator, hopefully I'll start to see the first seedlings after a week or so. Certainly in a fortnight, I want to see these trays full of young tomato plants. As I said, I will sow the rootstocks in a few days' time. The timing is something I'm still working on trying to get that right. Certainly my really early sowing of the varieties didn't work out well for me last year. I think partly because the rootstocks were surprisingly slow to get going. Um, the year before, they shot away and I was behind with the varieties. So it's going to be something I need to work on some more years of practice. I shall get a grip on that. But anyway, that is it for this video. Thanks ever so much for watching and bye for now.